Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this second lecture on, on products and delivery systems. So what we did in the previous lecture, I gave you a definition of a product. We also discussed the different types of products. We know that we get carrier link products as well as bioprecursor products. We also know that the carrier link products can be divided into our bipartite, our tripartite, and our mutual products. And we also discussed some utilities of products. So we know we can use products to increase the stability of a molecule, maybe increase the activity, and also, in some cases, improve patient acceptability. So there are numerous different advantages of using the prodrug approach in your structural modification in, in ways in which you would like then to try and optimize your lead compounds to get to a drug candidate. Then also in the previous lecture, we looked at important functional groups for carrier link products specifically. Remember, these are important groups for carrier link products, not bioprecursor products. So we looked at the alcohols and the carboxylic acids and the ways in which we can use the alcohols and the carboxylic acids to develop esters to make prodrugs that can be released um, inside the body. And we know that there are a number of advantages of using ester-like prodrugs, as we discussed in the previous lecture. So the next section that I would like to do is to first um, of all just discuss the importance of functional groups for carrier link prodrugs and in this case it's prodrugs with the amine functional groups. So the amine functional groups of a drug may be reacted with a carboxylic acid of, a, of the carrier to give the amide. So you see it's a similar approach to the, to the ester prodrugs but in this case you have, to need, you have to have a carboxylic acid and an amine group that can be then reacted with each other through chemical synthesis known as an amidase reaction or an amidation reaction. Sorry, it's an amidation reaction. So it can be reacted through an amidation reaction to give them the amide. So the amides are not generally used in prodrugs. And the reason for that is, is that the amides are quite stable towards metabolic hydrolysis. So amides are in most cases used if you want to improve the stability of your drug. But then remember that it may be, be cause some difficulty to actually then release your drug because the amides are stable towards metabolic hydrolysis. There are a few examples of drugs that have been made or prodrugs that have been made, made through the amide prodrug approach, um, but it is quite rare. In, in, um, main, in, in most of the case, cases, the carboxylic acid and the alcohol forming the ester type prodrug approach have been used to develop the 10% of prodrugs that are currently on the market. So just to show you the reaction scheme of how a, an amide prodrug gets made. So for instance, if you have the drug that has the amine functional group, it can then be conjugated with a carrier with a carboxylic acid through an amidation reaction, through an amidation reaction. So that's organic synthesis that gets done in the laboratory. And then what you will hopefully have in the end is your drug with the amide. This is an amide functional group and then our carrier. So this is the drug and hopefully what that will be marketed that you will have in your pharmacy that you can give to your patient. And then once it's in the patient's body, then there's um, in vivo, there's amidase enzymes. So amidase enzymes in the body that then converts the drug into its active form, so the drug and the NH, and then the inert, safe, and um, non-aminogenic carrier. So remember in this case, different from esterases is that if you have an amide, you use, it gets used amidase enzymes in the body. So amidase enzymes are also not as abundant as esterase enzymes. And that is another reason why we struggle with the uh, metabolic hydrolysis of the amidase, uh, amide prodrug is because there's not a lot of amidase enzymes um, in the body. So that again is a limiting factor that, um, that, that makes the molecule quite stable against metabolic hydrolysis. And we don't want a drug that is so stable against metabolic hydrolysis that it never gets at least from the prodrug. Um, because that is not why we're developing products. We're developing prodrugs so that the drug can remain intact until it reaches its site of action. And once it reaches its site of action, then the drug should be released 
And a lot of cases with the amide pro drugs, that is not the case, where the amide is just too stable and it doesn't undergo metabolism. So, like I said, there's been a, a few cases where amides have been used as prodrugs, and the following amides are exceptions and are used in prodrugs since they hydrolyze relatively easily. So, for instance, in this case, where you have the drug that has the amine group can be conjugated to a carboxylic acid carrier, and you can see this carboxylic acid carrier has the amine group, and this amine group can be protonated at physiological pH. Uh, and um, that can increase the water solubility. So this is actually a type of an amino acid. And we know amino acids are quite water soluble. So if you want to improve the, uh, the water solubility of your amine drug, then you can use this type of approach where you conjugate it with an amino acid and the amino acid will then increase the water solubility because it will be protonated at physiological pH. And similar to the ester prodrugs, if you have a carrier that is an aromatic group, then um, it will increase the, 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 um, the lipid solubility. So for instance, in this case, is where you have the drug with the amine carboxylic acid carrier that was conjugated to form the amide. And now you have a drug that, uh, that uh, prodrug that has this aromatic structure in there which will increase the lipophilicity and hopefully once it reaches its site of action then the drug will be released. But again in this case uh, quite difficult because that's an amide but as you will see with this compound there's an additional functional group in here. It's actually an amide and on this side it is an ester. So you can actually use this amide ester approach to make this carrier a little bit less stable and make it more prone to esterases, which will then hopefully also then enable more amidases reactions to take place. So this is another example of a carrier that can be used um, in a mite prodrug approaches. Then N manic bases, which is this example over here. Uh, N manic base lowers the basicity of amines. So that the prodrug is not protonated at physiological pH. And the prodrug is therefore more lipophilic than the drug compared to its protonated form. So in this case, this is an N-manic base. It lowers the basicity, and you will see it's not protonated at physiological pH, and you can use this approach if you want to increase the lipid solubility of amide prodrugs. Remember, an amine, which is protonated at physiological pH and, can, and is therefore more hydrophilic. Hydrophilic is more water-soluble. So please remember that. Go back to the drug design and discovery lectures. Have a look at ionization and protonation and the effect that ionization and protonation may have on the water solubility of, um, of your drug. So those are just some examples of where amide prodrugs can be used. So we, we, we're just going back a bit now um, because I want to specifically you now discuss carrier link prodrugs and give you some examples of carrier link prodrugs of drugs that's actually currently on the market. So just to recap again, we know that a prodrug is a pharmacologically inactive compound that is converted to an active drug by metabolic biotransformation and it can be enzymatic or non-enzymatic. We know that there are numerous uses of prodrugs and I will go through each of these, show you some examples of how these different approaches were used with prodrug development. We also know that we get two types of uh, prodrugs known as the carrier link prodrugs and the bioprecursor prodrugs. Now I haven't said much about the bioprecursor prodrugs yet. We will get to that in two lectures time where I'll show you what a bioprecursor prodrug looks like and um, how a bioprecursor prodrug gets used. So the carrier link prodrugs which we will be discussing in this lecture is divided into three different uh, types of carrier link prodrugs are bipartite, tripartite and are mutual. In this lecture we will only be discussing the bipartite carrier link prodrugs which is comprised of one carrier attach attached to the drug. In the next lecture we will discuss the tripartite and the mutual prodrugs. So let's have a look at some examples of carrier-linked bipartite products. So it's a carrier directly conjugated to our active molecule. So example number one is where you have a product for, for increased water solubility. So for instance, 
prednisolone and methylprednisolone are poorly soluble in water and they can therefore not be formulated into an aqueous injection, so for, to an IV injection. Both of these two drugs um, are actually marketed as prelone and medrol, but they are marketed as, as oral dosage forms and they can't be made into IV aqueous injection because they have poor water solubility. So what some drug design companies have done is to develop solumedrol and pediapid. So you can see what they've done here. On the active corticosteroid, there's a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid, and what they've used in this case, is a carrier that contained uh, an a, a, and, and, and carboxylic acid. So it's an alcohol on the corticosteroid, the active, and a carboxylic acid carrier. So they then conjugated this carboxylic acid carrier with the alcohol of the corticosteroid to form this type of molecule. It's a prodrug because you can see it's an ester prodrug known as solumedrol and it contains a carboxylic acid and that carboxylic acid will be ionized at physiological pH thus making it more water soluble. And in this case as well We've seen that you can use your phosphates also to increase water solubility and they basically did the same thing as what they did with solumedrol. They conjugated this um, phosphate to the alcohol of the, cort uh, the, um, alcohol, uh, of, of the uh, corticosteroid to form pediapid. So um, in both of these cases by using the prodrug approach they've increased the water solubility to make these type of molecules which could now be ionized to make it more water soluble and you can actually then formulate it into solumedrol and pediapid which are currently used as corticosteroids with its route of administration being an IV um, route of administration because it is more water soluble. Then this is another um, example of how you can increase water solubility using the prodrug approach. So the local anesthetic benzocaine is not suitable um, or soluble in water and can therefore not be formulated for aqueous injection. So the amino acid prodrug of this benzocaine is water soluble and is rapidly hydrolyzed in the, in the serum by amidase. So if you want to make an aqueous um, injection of the local anesthetic um, benzocaine, um, then they use this amino acid carrier. We know amino acids increase the water solubility, again protonated at physiological pH and amino acid carriers then increase the water solubility. So you can see in this case it is not an ester prodrug, but an amide prodrug. So there are amidase enzymes um, that can rapidly hydrolyze this carrier and then release this active of, um, of benzocaine um, in the serum. So that's one way in which you can increase water solubility. Then also a prodrug for improved absorption and distribution. So um, ephedrine um, or the, the dipivaloyl ephedrine, which is this one on this case, um, penetrates the cornea for the treatment of glaucoma, while ephedrine, which is in this case, is more water soluble. It does not. So you can see that the, the approach that they've used here, they use these aliphatic carbons. So a number of carbons that they conjugated to these alcohol groups to increase the lipophilicity. Now it's lipophilic enough to cross the cornea of the eye. Um, and then once it's um, inside the eye, it can hydrolyze into ephedrine that is used in glycoma. So this is another way in which you could use then a prodrug approach in this case now to increase the lipophilicity. A uh, prodrug for um, site-specific delivery, you can go through this in your own time. So this is where you have oxyphenacetin, where they then developed um, oxyphenacetin um, acetate that is used as a bowel sterilant using a prodrug approach to make it more site-specific. Please go through this on your own time. And then also other prodrugs for um, site-specificity. Um, so we know that the blood-brain barrier prevents hydrophilic molecules from entering the brain unless they are lipophilic enough. Now we know if we look at the log p value, it needs to be between 2 and less than 5. If it's more than 5, then it's too lipophilic and it won't cross. So the anticonvulsant drug, Vigabatrin, um, so you can see my notes, crosses the blood-brain barrier poorly. Um, a glycerol lipid known as... Um, Linenolyl, it's this one over here, it's on this R position over here, contains one GABA ester and one Vigabatrin ester. 
which is 300 times more potent in vivo um, than vigabatrin. So, for instance, the approach that they've used here is we know that we have GABA, that is the anticonvulsant, and we have this uh, um, vigabatrin, which is an inactivator of GABA and aminotransferase and an anticonvulsant. So both of these two drugs, you can see they contain carboxylic acids, they will be ionized at physiological pH, they won't be lipid uh, soluble enough to cross the blood brain barrier. So what they've then done, they combined the GABA and the vigabatrin, both which are active compounds, um, and they combined them through a carrier. And now this drug, if you go and calculate its log P values between 2 and 5, so this drug can actually then, go, or this pro drug can then go, cross the blood-brain barrier, and then once it's in the central nervous system, brain esterases will then form GABA, the GABA, and the carrier will be released, and the vigabatrin will be released. And like I've already said, it's 300 times more potent, this vigabatrin and GABA for that gets released from the prodrug, compared to when vigabatrin or GABA is just given on its own. And obviously, the reason for that is, is that GABA and vigabatrin can't cross the blood-brain barrier, but using this prodrug approach, both crosses the blood-brain barrier, it gets released in the central nervous system, and both can have the effect, and they can also be in much, much higher um, concentrations in the brain. So please go through this slide again, go through my notes, make sure that you understand this, because this is an excellent example of a mutual prodrug. So a mutual prodrug is where you have two actives, and in this case, both Vigabatrin and GABA are the two actives. And mark this as very, very important for the exams where we can um, ask you a question on, um, on products for site-specific delivery as well as where you can use a mutual prodrug approach. Then also some prodrugs to enhance the stability of the drug through protection from first-pass metabolism. So propranolol um, is rapidly metabolized in the liver after oral administration and it forms a propranolol o glucuronide So you can see on this position over here is the site of glucuronization in the liver, so it undergoes metabolism and gets excreted much, much quicker. So succinic acid of propranolol was prepared to block this glucuronide formation in the liver. So you can see at that site of glucuronidation in the liver, they've protected it with a succinic acid carrier. So this succinic acid carrier then protects it in, um, through first-pass metabolism, and once it reaches its site of action, um, then propranolol gets released, and you have a drug that is eight times as, as a, it's eight times higher following administration of the prodrug compared to the level, levels of the propranolol administration on its own. So the prodrug has improved the concentration of propranolol um, as much as eight times in the body. So obviously you will like, need less of the drug and also um, it, it will, could lead to less side effects because you have a lower concentration of the, of the actual drug using the pro-drug approach and you can still get to a level that is therapeutically active. So this is also quite important. So um, the type of carrier, carrier link products, we've already now discussed bipartite carrier link products. So everything that we've done up to now is our bipartite. It's where we just have a carrier directly conjugated to the, to, to the drug, except in that case of Vigabatrin and, um, and GABA. That is not a bipartite product, that is actually a mutual product. But all of the rest of the examples that I've given you in this section are bipartite carrier-linked products. So, um, there are some other drugs that you can also use that are bipartite carrier-linked products, and um, it's also to use products for slow and prolonged release. So, the advantages of prolonged release products are to reduce the number and frequency of doses, so for prolonged release, to reduce the number and frequency of doses, to eliminate nighttime administration, to minimize patient non-compliance, it allows for more constant blood levels, to reduce toxic levels, and to also reduce gastrointestinal side effects. So, prolonged release drugs are important in the treatment, in this case for psychosis, because these patients require medication for extended periods of time and often show high patient non-compliance. So long-chain aliphatic esters hydrolyze slowly and are suitable for prolonged release. So we discussed that already in the first lecture on, on prodrugs, 
where I showed you that aliphatic, long-chain aliphatic esters can cause steric hindrance and it can make that the drug hydrolyzes much slower and it's suitable for prolonged release. So for instance, this, uh, this drug over here is um, haloperidol or haldol uh, or sandals haloperidol and it's a potent central nervous system sedative, a tranquilizer, and antipsychotic. So it gets used as an antipsychotic. The problem with this drug is that it has a half-life of only two to six hours. And for patients who suffer from psychosis, we would like to have a drug that works on a much longer period of time. And we can see that on haloperidol, it has this alcohol group. So this alcohol group can be modified through synthesis to have a, a, an, an ester, a long chain um, ester or long chain aliphatic ester. And you can see this is what some drug design companies have actually done. They've protected this group over here, this hydroxyl group, and then attached a decanoic acid carrier, which is an 8-carbon, or actually a 9-carbon carrier that's been connected on this position. So that's a long-chain aliphatic ester that's been conjugated on this position. And now this um, aliperidol decanoate, known as haldol decanoate, is, an, is given as an intramuscular depot injection. So it's a depot injection. Depot inje injection is an injection that maybe if you, um, if you inject it at the site, it actually accumulates at that site and it sits there for a long time. And through this prodrug approach, it hydrolyzes very, very slowly. Hydrolyzes slowly and constantly to give, um, to, 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 to give this haloperidol. Um, once it's undergo hydrolysis. So you can see that if it's an intramuscular depot injection, the antipsychotic activity of this haloperidol decanoate is about one month. So obviously, better patient compliance, the drug gets released um, in a slow but constant rate um, through esterases that are present um, in your body to form this haloperidol. But remember, this is in a slow intramuscular depot injection and you can see the activity of this drug um, is now kept for one month. So you can go to the doctor once a month and you get a depot injection and um, the treatment is effective for one month. This is another example. You can go through this in your own uh, uh, time. This is again an antipsychotic drug, uh, flufenazine decanoate, that's been used in a similar approach as haloperidol, um, where they again try to make an antipsychotic drug that um, has activity for about one month through the intramuscular depot injection compared to when it's not a pro drug, it has a short duration of activity of only six to eight hours. There's also been um, some cases where they've made pro drugs to minimize toxicity and many of the pro drug examples already discussed already have the property of lower toxicity. For instance, pro drugs for site specific delivery, delivery on section 6.2 for example, ephedrine has ocular and systemic side effects not found in um, dipivaluyl ephedrine that's been used uh, for glycoma. The product to enhance stability, for example, the succinic acid ester of propranolol is less toxic than propranolol. So that's another example where um, we've used products to minimize toxicity. Also, products for prolonged release, for example, the decanoic acid ester of haloperidol is less toxic than haloperidol because there's a much slower release of the decanoic acid haloperidol so the, uh, the rate is, is kept constant and your dosage level is also kept constant thus making it less toxic than haloperidol. So these, this is a nice exam question where I can also ask you give me a few examples of how the products were used to minimize toxicity and then you can use any of these three examples to explain your answer. Um, the, this is another product where they could use um, uh, aspirin um, to minimize the toxicity. Like for instance, aspirin causes gastrointestinal side effects. And the main reason it causes gastrointestinal side effects is because of this carboxylic acid on aspirin. That carboxylic acid lowers the pH in the gastrointestinal tract. And it also leads to other reactions in the gastrointestinal tract that leads to some side effects. Um, so what some researchers have done, they've um, included a carrier on this position where they mask or uh, you know, mask this carboxylic acid with the carrier and what you see here is that you have no gastrointestinal side effects. It can be absorbed and once it's absorbed, 
the carrier gets released and then what you have is your active um, aspirin which is which is um, the one that you want so that's another approach where you can use um, pro drugs to minimize toxicity this is an example of a pro drug where you can increase patient acceptance by increasing the lipophilic nature of a molecule so for instance clindamycin is an antibacterial drug that has a very bitter taste and then what some researchers have done to improve the taste of clindamycin is by including this um, long aliphatic carbon chain on the alcohol of clindamycin and in this case it has a better taste because it can't dissolve in the saliva because you need a drug that is more um, water soluble to dissolve in your mouth so in this case it doesn't dissolve so now the taste is much better compared to um, clindamycin so this is one example of how you can use pro drugs to increase patient compliance and you can have a look at this um, example here as well where they've tried to increase the water solubility of clindamycin to make it a less painful intravenous um, injection to make it more water soluble so please go through this example on your own time so guys that brings me to the end of this section um, what we need to do crystal in this pro drugs is to discuss the tripartite pro drugs the mutual pro drugs and then also our bioprecursor pro drugs which we will complete um, in the next lecture i really do hope that you that you like this um, online lecture uh, please make notes of any questions that you may ha have and we will discuss any of the questions that you have um, in next week. Thank you.